So what's left in Coulomb's law? Um, the only things we have left that we haven't explained yet are that four pi epsilon in the denominator. So let's let's take a look at the four pi term, um, and let's do this by simplifying Coulomb's law a little bit more. Um, this is our full expression right here. Okay. If we basically set r q equal to zero and put the charge at the origin, which we're allowed to do because of translational symmetry, we simplify it to here. Um, and we know that this vector, essentially, r sub m, can be represented as the length of r sub m um, times a unit vector pointing in the r direction. Now, this is pretty bogus because it's really hard to calculate what r is, but that's perfectly legitimate. If we do this, this upper part cancels out with that cube part down there, and we end up with this expression right here. So we see, essentially, that we have a term in the denominator that's 4 pi r squared. It turns out that the area of a sphere is also 4 pi r squared, and this isn't a coincidence at all. Coincidence at all. So let's take a charge Q that's generating these invisible force rays. And I'm, I'm going to say we've got rays extending out in every direction from the charge. Um, let's put a sphere around that charge that has some area, and you'll see that all of the invisible force rays go through that area right there. And this has basically um, some length we're going to call R1. Let's put another sphere, bigger, with a bigger radius around that charge. Now you'll see that some of the force rays actually miss and don't go through that area anymore as the sphere of radius R2, a larger than R1, gets bigger. And if we have a third sphere as well, you'll see even more of the for force rays miss. What does this mean? Essentially, what it says is the number of force rays that go through a unit area will drop off as the ratio of that area to the area of the sphere. Because the force rays have to all go through the sphere somewhere, right? So the entire sphere includes them, but the number of force rays per unit area drops off as the square of the distance. And that's why we have the the expression of Coulomb's law the way we have. Because as you get further and further away from the charge, um, the electric field is going to drop off as the square because you simply have less force rays from that charge that are going to hit the place you're looking at. This is an analogy. It's not a particularly good one. But it helps explain why you have this 4 pi r squared term in the denominator. The only other thing we need to explain is this term epsilon. It turns out that that's just a proportionality constant. We actually have to have all of this work out in the units that we work with because we're going to be measuring forces in pounds or newtons or, or whatever. And so this doesn't just work out by itself. We need some constant to balance things. And so we call epsilon the permittivity, and we'll learn more about it later. But it's just essentially the constant to get everything to work out correctly. So let's summarize where we are with Coulomb's law. We have essentially a charge, Q, that's a fundamental property of matter that creates at every point in space a vector we call the electric field that acts like invisible force rays. That electric field, if another charge were to come in, would create a force on other charges. So charges only push on other charges. Okay, That force is given by this expression right here. It turns out the direction of the electric field, and hence the direction of the force, is away from the charge, from the position of the charge, r sub q, to the point we're measuring. So it always pushes away from the charge, or pulls towards, towards the charge, as we'll see in a minute. It falls off as the square of the distance. I know there's a cube here, but remember we also have a distance up in the numerator, so that's going to turn into a square. So that if you're one unit away from the charge, the electric field, and the force on another charge will be 1. If you're two units away, it's one over two squared or one fourth, three units one ninth, four units one sixteenth, ten units one one hundredth. So the force in the electric field can drop off very rapidly as you move away from charges. We have a four pi down here in the denominator because things will drop off as the square of the distance, and that essentially accounts for the area of a sphere. And epsilon is just a number that keeps the forces measured in newtons and all the units to work out properly. It's a proportionality constant. So let's plug some numbers in and see what we get.
Um, it turns out that the standard measure of charge is something called a coulomb. Uh, we represent it by a capital C in the meter kilogram second uh, MKS notation system, and one charge is the amount that one current, one amp of current will deliver in one second. So if we think, and this is a terrible analogy, but if we think of turning on electricity like a spigot and we collect a glass of charge, um, one coulomb's worth, one amp will fill that glass in one second. It turns out that, that the fundamental particles, protons and electrons of atoms that carry charge have very, very small charges, something like 1.6 times 10 to the 19 coulombs for, an elect for a proton and negative 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs for an electron. Protons have positive charge, electrons have negative charge, you know this. Um, we also need to remember that the mass of electrons are also very small. These masses are very tiny as well. So let's look at some numbers, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I'm going to give you something to look through to calculate some actual forces from Coulomb's Law.